2017, crypto bull market just came. We gathered a lot of high-profile people. So many founders came to Korean market and we evangelized a lot of people to come. And that's how we initiate the Korean crypto community. But this is something I didn't anticipate. Ryan Kim is the founding partner at Hash, a global early stage venture fund focused on backing founders who are pioneering the future of blockchain and cryptocurrency. What is Hash and why did you start it seven years ago? I truly believe the decentralized network and bypassing VC round we can raise from the people directly. So we give out the tool to the founders, kind of alternative VC system. How do you define who is a winner and who is not? Practically, how many users they onboarded is very important rather than just FTV or valuation, two or three metrics are very important to define the success or not. Can you tell me what you guys are doing exactly with anime and K-pop? Anime now is like all time high. We want to onboard a Japanese IP to the blockchain space. K-pop has a global audience. Fans, when they onboard, they can buy NFTs and it can be a game changer. You're the second person on this podcast who is extremely bullish on... Uh... What do you like so much about the team. Um, seventy-five percent of you that watch this channel frequently do not subscribe. If you like this show and think it provides value to you in your crypto investing journey, can you please, please, please do me a favor and subscribe to this channel? Hit the like button and leave a comment below. It helps this channel more than you can imagine. The bigger the channel the bigger the guests and the better the conversation. Thank you. Today's conversation is supported by Jupiter, the most used decentralized exchange in crypto and the largest DEX by volume on Solana. Mantle, a leading Ethereum layer two with more than $2 billion in total value locked and $3 billion in liquid treasury. And Astar Network, a scalable network connecting people to Web3 through entertainment, blockchain development and community events. Ryan, welcome to the podcast. Let's start with uh, maybe some of your background. Who are you? Yeah. Um, my name is Ryan and co-founder and partner at Hashed. So I started, no, we started from 2016. At the time, we were just an uh, individual investor. Me and other co-founders, just you know, every weekend we met together just ha, ha, just drank a coffee and studied uh, Ethereum, Bitcoin. And this way, uh, Vitalik said this one, why he said this. And at the time, like EOS was rising. So like then Rarima says this, why he, he is a, a discussed with um, like his, his friends and like, in the community. And the kind of like a topics that we always uh, you know, discussed. And 2017, like crypto bull market just came. So uh, we gathered a lot of you know, high profile people such as developers, founders, conglomerates and venture capitalists. And we evangelize them like blockchain is the future. You should invest to crypto or you should invest to blockchain company and founder, you know, you should come and build a project on top of here. And because you no, know, our background is like an engineer and an entrepreneur. Me, I founded my uh, one company. I sold that, sold that out to the big data company. And I worked there for three years as a data scientist. And I realized like a blockchain will be a heaven for a data scientist. So um, we evangelize a lot of people to come. And that's how we initiate the Korean crypto community. Actually, you no. Know, if you think about Korean market, always Korean market uh, has been a strategic market for everyone. So 2017, so many founders came to Korean market and we introduced them to the, um, our network, our community, and they engaged with them uh, to onboard, onboard to their project. And we uh, became like out of sudden, like private sale investors, kind of crypto fund. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because that's, yeah. <laughs> so the idea initially was we have a passion, mm -hmm. but a passion is much more fun when it's shared, right? Yeah. So let's build a community and share this thing that we think is going to change the world with as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. And then what? It's because the community became sizable mm -hmm. that you got access to these deals. Yeah, that's, that's kind of, <laughs> it, 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 out of sudden, it became a tactic for us 
But at the beginning, we just gathered and shared this idea to them because this is fun. And, you know, more people, more fun. So <laughs> as you know, we get that like uh, every week, uh, 100 people and sharing our idea and our, our founder's idea. And like, what's your thought? What's your thought? Like, you no, know, we discuss a lot and like, uh, maybe we can do something because you no, know, our background is like I said, uh, entrepreneur. So we want to make a value in this community mm. and in the industry. So uh, we, of course, no, we, at the time we were just invest, investor, but uh, we nurture a lot of resources to our like founders. So that's how just spontaneously we started like uh, investment. Was this a side hobby, like a side hustle or... Did you have a main job um, at, at that the time? At the time, yeah. At the time, I was a data scientist. So I developed a personalization algorithm for small uh, e-commerces. So actually, I dealt uh, data. So I felt like, ah, oh, data scientist was quite hard at the time, 2016, 15. But actually... All business opportunity belongs to big tech science, not data scientist. Data scientist just you know so making good algorithm for big companies. So basically, uh, they can make their own company. But in blockchain space, uh, all data is open. So the data scientists can utilize any type of data on on a blockchain. So I believe, oh, data scientist with uh, economy uh, knowledge they can make a lot of business in here. So, okay, I will, I will jump in. That was uh, 2017. Okay, so you said you built and sold a company before, right? Yes. Why did you decide to move on to the investing side of entrepreneurship mm. instead of being a builder, right? Because mm -hmm. it's two very different things that require different skills mm -hmm. and that some are better at one and some are better at the other. Yeah, yeah. I I think, you no. Know, maybe I feel like the meeting, like a lot of people and learn the new idea was, I think, I, I, I enjoyed a lot. Mm. And actually I can just stick to just one project and I can build for a few years. That also I can do, but um, like blockchain space, at the time blockchain, blockchain space was a very nascent and we don't know what is a final form of the blockchain or a final form of like, like, like business, I mean industry. So maybe this phase, maybe next couple of years, I want to invest like top tier founder and learn why he think this technology is usable in this, in this mm. industry. Yeah. And then now it's like, we invest like over 200 companies and still I'm learning. So it starts as a community that you grow out of passion. And then how does it work? Like some people who come to this community, they're actually founders and they say, Hey, do you want to invest in my project? Or mm. how do the first allocation come yeah. along? Um, at the beginning, um, usually we approached to, uh, the best project out of the world and who want to come to Korean market and we connect them to the Korean, our community mm. and the community itself was a very purely, uh, content centric, not sales. So there's a new idea, new consensus algorithm or new, um, new uh, token design, the, the, the kind of stuff they introduce and purely academic. Um, but a lot of founder was very satisfied from the, the community activities. So they gave us like a location like, oh, okay, I want to onboard you guys. I want you guys to, you know, monitor the Korean market, maybe uh, making more partnership here or engage with a lot of high profile people, um, please help us. And we got the location from them. And yeah, that's how we started. Yeah. 
So you have the right, so you, you become kind of like a coherent partner for businesses that yeah. want to go global, right? And so the, that's the interesting point maybe out of that is how do you survive during that time? Because it's cool to get an allocation, mm -hmm. but you're actually not being paid, right? And if you think about how crypto works, the crypto economy is a, is a lot like that. Mm -hmm. Who gets the best allocations? Mm. And then there might be a payout or a handsome payout, right? There might not be. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, you need to kind of survive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what was, did you just feel like, I mean, you had your main job, right? Oh man, it's fun. I'm going to do that on the side. Plus I have some upside if the thing works. Or uh, now let's go full time. But we need a way to make a living out of that. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, we're not sure that how long it's going to take for this product to go out, you know, out there on the markets. Mm -hmm. How did you manage this? It's a very unique yeah. aspect to crypto, right? Yes. yes. Even, even today, when, when you talk to content creators or, or even employees of project, there's a lot of, hey, you get an allocation to this token. If it goes well, you're going to do well. In the normal startup world, yes, you get shares, but you also get a salary. Mm. In crypto, uh, there is almost this thing where uh, you get an allocation, even let's say now, crypto market is starting to do really well. The founders are kind of the kings, right? Hey, mm -hmm. you are allowed an, uh, an allocation in my project and in, in exchange, you're going to do all this stuff for me. Mm -hmm. So basically you need to work and invest. Yeah. Right? Yes. It's very, yeah. It's very, it's an aspect that I don't think we see in many other or, or any other industry. Yeah, yeah. So how did you deal with that in the beginning? Yeah. So at the beginning, <clears throat> before uh, becoming a full-time job for as, as an investor, so until 2017, November, I was locked to the previous company. Uh, but so 2017 was kind of, you know, a little bit overlapped. You know, main job was a uh, daytime. I worked in the previous company, but you no. Know, so I just, after after you no know, after six p.m., I turned out to be an investor, and I think most uh, like usable way to uh, to help a founder is obviously network. So, if I have to work like uh, you no know, writing a lot of contents or a marketing job or BD or developer, definitely you no know, a lot of time is needed, but at the time like. No, because our previous like you no know, track record, uh, already we are very well connected to all the web to VC or founder and developer. So just connecting them to uh, the right partnership was very, very valuable for them. So at the beginning, we maximize our network uh, to help them out. You are from Korea. You understand deeply the culture there mm -hmm. and the market landscape. Why is crypto retail market so huge? Why was it already so hot in 2017? And why is it one of the biggest retail market in the world today? Mm -hmm. So Korean market is like very unique. You no, know, that means like a lot of people, if someone makes so much money from investment, everybody just copy and follow very easily. Let's say I'm a new crypto investor. Mm -hmm in Singapore or in Europe or in the US and I totally dismiss the Korean market. Mm -hmm. What am I missing in the big picture? Let's say as an investor and also as a founder. Mm -hmm. I, I would say like, you know, Korea is the most important market. Of course, like one of the most important markets in the world, mm -hmm. because if you think about like KW, uh, crypto pair, um, up it and be some like you know this like local exchanges you no know, market share is like one of the you no know, I think top two of course like the other one it should be a USD of course like crypto. can you give some numbers so uh, so people can represent like hey look there is fifty million people. 50 million people in Korea mm -hmm. but look the numbers compared to the US or to you know, other big uh, countries in crypto. Mm -hmm. 
these are the numbers despite you know having much fewer current people yeah, yeah. who are in crypto like to understand how much like what it represents so now it's like you no know, market show wise of course like uh like except the crypto crypto exchanges crypto crypto is like a, of course binance okx bybit they're better but No, Upbit, uh, Upbit and Bitsum has just a uh, KRW and crypto pair. Of course, BTC pair exists, but almost like uh, zero. Mm. But a uh, crypto KRW pair wise, uh, every day, like three to four billion USD, uh, the trading volume is uh, traded in those market. And if you think about uh, Coinbase, like uh, maybe one to two billion trading volume. Mm. So USD wise, uh, Korean mar- Korean The fiat crypto pair is uh, higher than Coinbase, and uh, also um, like uh, see the the percentage wise, twenty percent is like you no know, active uh, traders in Korea out of total population. I guess uh, US is like a five to ten percent. So it's two thousand seventeen. You find yourself in this crazy Korea retail market. It's very hot there. You feel, and you're passionate, you have a passion for, you know, crypto, you build this community. Yeah. What makes you take the leap? Um, why, why did you launch, what is hashed and why did you start it seven years ago? Yeah. Good question. Because it could be just something for fun, right? Hey, I get some allocations here. I'm not going to go all in. I am very truly believed uh, the decentralized network because I, I, I you know, you, you, if you think about narrative, Bitcoin just started just after 2008 uh, financial crisis. We all know like the Wall Street, the financial system is very vulnerable. Uh, always the US government is printing money. And this is like always all, all the people in this industry you know, has same spirit. Something wrong happened. Mm. And Bitcoin is fixing something and making balance. But you this. come more from the Ethereum side initially. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because Bitcoin was like just kind of if i feel bitcoin was a little bit commodity mm. there's not many uh create i mean software can be deployed on top of bitcoin right mm. but ethereum thesis was like they wanted to be a like, global computing system not only just a financial system but the vision in, um, embraced all kinds of computing all kinds of financial system will be deployed on top of ethereum Uh, we resonate that, and as also uh, you no know, previously, I I was you no know, founder in software industry, also data scientist. So I feel like more opportunities can come into the market uh, through Ethereum technology, and eventually, for, I think first first uh, first inf- invention was ICO, even though like ninety nine point nine percent of ICO was kind of shit but yeah it was no it was quite innovative because you no know, people can raise money without and bypassing VC round they can raise from the people directly so either and give out the tool to the the founders uh, kind of alternative VC system so it was wow like no and actually we invested a lot to the ICO How, how did this turn out for you? Um, almost zero, <laughs> most of them. Almost? I mean, uh, it- yeah, yeah, many of them I lost it, lost it, but a um, few of them, like uh, at the time, Omisego, Kaiba Network, still alive. Mm. EOS was also one of the prominent projects at the time, and many uh, L1 projects as well. So, like, I think our hit ratio was uh, 20 to 30%, percent, but it made like 100x, 200x. Mm. So that was, oh, okay. We can, maybe we can start our own uh, crypto fund with this, like, like uh, the, the treasury. So. When did you launch the crypto fund? Mm-hmm. 
like officially go from, hey, we're a bunch of people who have a passion and are early investors because we have allocation to, hey, we'll build a structure around that. Mm -hmm. um, w when was that? Uh, 2018. So after the, the crash? Yeah, 2017 was um, kind of, you know, we built uh, all the communities and actually peak was uh, January 2018. Mm. So after that still, you know, market was quite active. You know, nobody thinks this is like, you know. <laughs> the beginning of yeah, the Yeah, this is a peak. <laughs> oh, more, you know, the other peak is coming. But, you know, 2018, November just dropped to... Uh, 3K, you know, Bitcoin 3K. 3, yeah, 3.5K, yeah. 3 to 3.5K. And like, oh, sh shit. <laughs> <laughs> we we uh, rent out all the office. We hire like uh, 20, 30 people. And like every day, every month, we spend a lot of money. And now like, oh, maybe uh, we need to, we need to uh, minimize our cost, spending everything. And we need to secure our investment budget as well. Most of the investment, um, first 2018, they kind of list to the exchange that means that we don't have a liquidity at all. So, uh, you know, we get that all people, all uh, like, you know, members and discuss how we can, we survive the next two years. Because you had this belief that crypto would come back. Yeah. What around the halving, or you? What was your thesis? Or you're just thinking, oh man, like we have so much passion because that's what keeps you in crypto, right? Mm -hmm. First, you go for the gains, and then you stay for the passion because it makes so much sense. Yeah, I think the fun fun thing of uh, crypto is like everybody is very fanatic. Everybody is has a religion of Bitcoin or block, blockchain, so the means like it's not opportunistic. We truly believe uh, the decentralization thesis and the narrative. Mm. So even though market you know, went down, we truly believed like this will come within one to two years, but it can be three years. So uh, that's why I know at the time we were a little bit worried, but we didn't, we didn't worry that uh, the blockchain will die. Mm. Yeah. What is hash today? Today? I'll say like um, over seven years, last seven years, we improved ourselves every year. At the beginning, we were a little bit just kind of community driven funds. That means like a little bit, mm, depending on the person, I mean, depending on one person or uh, this, the process was a little bit incomplete, but over time, uh, we built a system process and now we are getting more institutionalized. We have a lot of system inside, uh, all like, uh, like staffs, you no, know, they know what they do and know, they know how to, how to work better and we always guide them. And I feel now hash is more like institution rather than just re, uh, syndicate, like investing together. Yeah, started as an angel syndi syndicate yeah. around the community, which if you think about it is how a lot of these funds start, right? Mm -hmm. And some people stay at that, at that stage. Hey, let's just stay a bunch of angels together, mm -hmm. team up and, uh, and do this uh, because the returns can be so amazing that you don't have to go through the, the compliance and all that stuff, right? That comes with an actual real fund. Yes. Yes. We're always thinking like, no, before this interview, you said like, oh, no, I'm not doing this for money. Mm. You're doing this for karma. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we also, we always care ecosystem. So uh, we're talking with a lot of players, of course, like for, for the uh, better return. But at the same time, we're talking with um, politician, governor, regulator, how we can make better ecosystem together, how we can make uh, crypto-friendly policies 
And we are researching all the cases outside, like US, Europe, and Singapore, Hong Kong, Bahrain, Abu Dhabi. <laughs> and we consolidate all the uh, policies and we educate our uh, regulator. Uh, you, now Korea is in the middle of a competition. You should go forward. And then a lot of the founders will be attracted to the regulation. Then uh, it's all good. I mean, good for country, good for like, ecosystem, good for community, good for founders, good for like, like companies here. So um, I think um, what I, what, why we are doing this is more like making better, better world, better ecosystem more making a sustainable ecosystem. That's why uh, we're contributing our, our capital and resources to the, to the ecosystem. What's the, best decision you, what's the best decision you've made in the last seven years? Last seven years? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, basically, we are quite long-term holder for everything. Like, because no, our... We are a little bit, uh, we're, we're not good at, uh, I would say, uh, we are always resonating the founder's vision. And we, if the founder is really uh, a good executor, of course, but good visionary leader, then we want to support them uh, like forever. <laughs> we want to see that dream comes true. Uh, so for example, 2019 in the middle of a crypto winter, just after Bitcoin dropped to a uh, 3,500, um, we, of course, we believed a uh, blockchain and maybe, uh, uh, 2017, 18, uh, there were so many ICOs, but where's the use case still, no, a lot of people share now, where's the use case? What is the most successful, uh, like application, et cetera, et cetera. 2019. Just on that, just on that. Mm -hmm. What do you answer to people today in 2024, mm -hmm. to people who ask this question? Uh, you mean learn from, from them? Where's the use case? Where's the use case? Obviously, um, uh, I think finance sector, like a payment or like lending and borrowing tax exchange with very obvious uh, use cases. But on top of that, like, you know, gaming or social and a lot of like mass adaptive services, we can see some of the small uh, successful cases and forecaster just, you know, you know, smashing the market. But I feel um, more use cases will come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But so, so nothing that really has reached mass population yet, no, except yeah. maybe let's say stable coins, payment. Yeah. Stable coins as a store of value for kind of developing countries, mm -hmm. Bitcoin as a store of value, mm -hmm. but not much that has reached mass adoption yet. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. I think stable coin is like most successful use case mm. in the world so far. So 2019. Mm -hmm. So 2019, um, we believe like, uh, the gaming sector will come first because if you look back, um, the internet era, to, uh, 2000, 1999, first internet come, um, always like mass adoption will come last at the beginning, truly believer, early adopter use the service first. Um, and then more broader uh, mass, uh, broader mass, the targeted service come out, like music service or some of the, the maybe uh, e-commerces. Then like you know, becoming like messenger and social network. So there's a stage, but always the first stage is like gamble or. You know, like sexual size. Yeah. A very, very uh, niche, but very addicted services. And then a little bit more entertaining service. That's game. Still addictive, but entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. But not, not illegal. <laughs> <laughs>
I think uh, gaming should be, uh, we believe gaming should be a first uh, service should come in the market 2019. So we decided to open up the, the temporary uh, structure named the Hash Labs, which is like kind of incubation, incub incubation uh, team. Um, we, at the time we invested like eight gaming companies. So out of eight, uh, X Infinity and Sandbox, we were first check investor, uh, mythical games. Very first check investors. Yeah, very first in Axie and Sandbox. Yeah, yeah. And uh, mythical games and um, Node Games, which is a Korean company. Those are all like uh, became uh, became a unicorn. So uh, it was quite high, high hit ratio. Like out of eight, four became a unicorn. So with that, uh, we. Still, we believe uh, gaming will be a huge. At the same time, 2019, MicroDAO just came out and like becoming like guru of, I mean, like Mesha of the Ethereum mm. and revived the, the ecosystem. So your thesis was let's invest in these games, right? The eight games. Mm -hmm. And as you said before, you want to help founders accomplish their visions, which would mean that you hold, do you hold all your tokens still in these companies? What's your mm. way to play that? Yeah. Um, of course, not everything. We are still holding like a uh, quite, quite significant amount. Mm. And um, like Sandbox still, you no, know, we, we can see the, the product, but current product is not final form of the product. So still we are supporting them. XC, they like, XC Infinity itself is doing really well. But at the same time, the SkyMapis team launched a new L1 loaning. Yep. So we are helping out the loaning success as well. Hey, when shift happens, family. Time to toast our partner, Divin. They're taking luxury wine to the blockchain with their super fun concept called Uncork to Earn. Buy your favorite wines, enjoy unique experiences, and get an airdrop each time you open a bottle with your friends. Cheers to Divin for bringing transparency, authenticity, and exclusivity to the fine wines industry. What's the worst decision you made in the last seven years? Um, a lot. So, so many. <laughs> I think I'll say... Um, 2022, 2021. Um, still, at the time, we, we invested a lot of projects in the, in the, in the middle of the bull market. Um, I would say, like, um, our system was not settled down yet. So a little bit, the management of the, the token, for example, like... Um, like following up with uh, with the founders and checking in like uh, these founders going right way or wrong way, and somehow at the time like uh, our capacity is a little bit saturated, so we couldn't follow up uh, all the founders. So too the, too many investments in too many companies, too many company, too many investors, uh, too many uh, projects. And we couldn't manage uh, that well at the time. A little bit over capacity. Do, does it mean also you said, uh, we, if I'm not mistaken, you said we invested too much during the bull run. Does that mean that you have also a thesis that says we should invest more in bear market? Yeah. yeah. Like basically timing these markets one way or another. Mm -hmm. We have like different... Uh, so I had Arthur Reyes on this podcast and he very openly says we invested in 2023 and now we don't invest anymore. Mm. Even if we find a good project, it's too late because with the, with the vesting and the, and the cliff and all that stuff, right? Yes. Even if it's a good project, I'll be in the bear market wrecked. Yes. We also had Jordi Alexander from Cellini. Mm -hmm. He says, oh, look, I mean, obviously it's kind of like sensitive to these bull markets, but like he says, if we find a good project today, mm -hmm. we're still going to invest. How do you guys think about that? Yeah. Always we believe um, um, 
constantly, cons constantly investing to founder and projects is the best way. Even if it's a bull market or bear market, but more strategically, I think you no. Know, uh, investing more aggressively in in bear market, and maybe a little bit investing less in bull market is better. Obviously, because you no, know, the valuation is totally different, different level. Is there a moment you say you'll stop? Mm -hmm. For example, maybe as it relates to your know, Bitcoin halving mm -hmm. plus twelve or eighteen months. Is there a moment where you say? Ah oh man, we would love to invest in this one, but now is really not the right time because if we feel it's late in the cycle. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, investment is like not just like you no, know, you no. Know, we are not looking only a vision, right? Of course, we see a condition, valuation, mm. or like a timing as well. Everything should be uh, considered. Um. Sometimes yes, like you no. Know, even though the uh, we like the founder, but sometimes the valuation is like super high, then maybe it's not our fit. Mm. Uh, but at least you know, we try to put a little bit because to engage with the team. You know, eventually, uh, we're not only just maximizing our profit, but we're expanding our network. If she is a really good founder, eventually he is, we think he is a winner, then um, we put a bit of capital to them and resonate with the founder's uh, vision and uh, introducing them to the, the right partner or right uh, ecosystem. How do you define who is a winner and who is not? Mm. Um... I think more uh, like uh, practically, um, the user activity and user user uh, how, how many how many user they onboarded is very important rather than just FTV or valuation. So for for instance, like this technology or SaaS business or infra tech, you no, know, they always lay say, like now it's like three billion, four billion, five billion. <laughs> But eventually they have to prove themselves like with the user metric. And now so maybe TVL also a good metric to measure like how successful they are. Uh, yeah, maybe just two or three metrics are very important to define the success or not. Do you believe in fundamentals in crypto? Or do you think that fundamentals are a meme? If we look at, the reason I'm asking that is and I had this conversation with many people on this podcast. One of them is Alex Vanevik, who was actually saying fundamentals are bearish in crypto. Mm. And we see that with you know, Ethereum, Lido, kind of Uniswap maker, how they performed, right? Because the fundamentals would essentially put a ceiling on the valuation. Mm. Whereas a project without fundamentals that we could call bubble assets, mm -hmm. memes, meme coins, AI, gaming, don't really have kind of benchmarks, mm -hmm. at least yet, and therefore are much more prone to go crazy, which you did really well in 2019, right? Investing in gaming. So like, how much do you balance between fundamentals and kind of like these bubble assets mm. and potential narratives mm. that you think will make the best returns because there is no fundamentals and, and benchmark yet? Mm -mm. So eventually, you know, uh, we try to expose uh, every type of assets to learn, but sometimes, no, sometimes there's nothing to learn. <laughs> but um, I believe, I believe the fundamental is there. That means, like now, so in the real life, in real world, like the why the property or stock market or like you no, know, the valuation is like several hundred billion dollar. Is that they're making so much money, of course, like USD or local currency. And we basically believe the, the government system. Maybe we believe the US. Uh, that's why you know, USD is still have a fundamental. The, the fundamental of USD is like, like trust of US government, right? So fundamental of like crypto is like 
trust to uh, Bitcoin or the trust of uh, Ethereum. And all people around this industry, they believe Bitcoin. So how strong you believe is, I think, fundamental. And mm. eventually, I, I think um, next bull market, huge bull market, I think this is just mini bull market. The huge bull market is like integrating between a crypto, crypto economy and real world economy. I think at that point, you know, all the capital will concentrate uh, the, this, this area. When do you think this is happening and how? Already, already I think a BTC ETF is the first case. BTC ov obviously listed on uh, all the crypto exchanges, DAX or like BTC L2, whatever. And now it's like, you know, institutional monies are you know, flowing into a BTC through a BTC ETF. And this is a very simple asset, but eventually they will open up more and more and more than more assets will be selected by an uh, institution. <clears throat> I think it, it happened uh, already in previous, I mean, uh, internet era. Uh, for example, uh, MP3. MP3 was you know, freely traded all over the world through a torrent or like eMonkey or like other, yeah. a lot of like, yeah. like pirate sites was there, right? They freely... Uh, I mean, send and receive the data or file, MP3 or video, but out of sudden, like, you know, governments regulate everything and the guideline, guideline came out. And in Korea also, there was a uh, Sorinara, which is a freely traded MP3 free, uh, MP3 free market. But out of sudden, like a, a Apple Music, Spotify, and Korea local company like Box, and like a mm -hmm. lot of like local MP3 player came out with better user experience and better UI, and with compliance. So eventually, I think um, there will be a comprom there will be a comprom compromised between a regulate regulation and uh, like crypto natives and the market, the lot of capital will be you know, flowing. And then like the, the, the company uh, who take care of this, this stream will win over the competition. Does it mean that it's risky as an investor to play this, the cycles that we, that we might miss out this like huge super cycle? Mm -hmm. Or do you think that it's a more kind of progressive thing is still going to take a lot of time. Everything takes time and there's still going to be these big bubbles, bursts, mm. bubbles, bursts and cycles. Um, you I don't think care because you're just, will in, be <laughs> you're just in there forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think not like, you know, 2018 or 2022, like every bear market came, no, 70% Price, uh, price down. But I think when it, now, from now on, at least BTC, when they price down, <clears throat> a lot of new capital come in and will buy it. But they know, historically, they know you know buying in the deep <laughs> is uh, always uh, prof profitable if the this asset class will go up uh, over like decades. So uh, Bitcoin, uh, the price volatility, will be much lesser than last cycle, but you no know, other, other assets like Ethereum. I think Ethereum is in the middle, but other L1, other L2 is still, I think volatility should be quite high. Which means opportunity also. Yes. Big opportunity. Yeah. Once they are very legit, you no, know, potentially they got proved by uh, maybe regulator, like, um, you know, once you no, know, the they they can they can list on the stock exchange uh, as uh, with a ETF format. Hong Kong will list it, Korea will list it, Japan will list the ETF. Oh, all, all uh, the institutional uh, the market will approve that is legit. So um, this is kind of side effect of the the BTC ETF in the stock US stock exchange, but 
I think more the, and the people will care more about this, uh, this, uh, this, this conditions. So the days of uh, Bitcoin, I think 2022, I did the, cal the calculation the other day. Mm -hmm. I think it was still down like 80 plus percent, right? 80% from yeah. 69 to 40, uh, 15, mm -hmm. 84, I don't remember. And I was even, I was surprised, right? Mm. When, when everybody thought that, yeah, it would not be that, that bad. So you think these days are over? Yeah. Still retail, retail investor, the portion was too big and always retail investors are very sentiment driven trading. <laughs> so. Oh, I'm bearish then. He is bearish. Everybody bearish. Everybody sell. <laughs> but institutions are more like, you no, know, they're more calculating like the opportunities. So once, for example, over 50 to 60% of the trading volume, uh, you no, know, traded by uh, institutions, then like the price swing should be a uh, minimal. How can we avoid another Luna or FTX or Celsius in the future? Mm -hmm. Mm. Or is it just inevitable as part of, you know, these very innovative markets where you have a lot of buzz, you have these bubbles, a lot yeah. of leverage in the mm. system. And then when everything blows up, I mean, when leverage unwinds, companies blow up, which would mean that in the, in the, in this bull run, right? Yeah. The one that, exp that implode is probably going to be much worse because just of the scale of the markets. <laughs> I think... Being more transparent is the most important. Like the way, uh, you know, they don't know how, where the Bitcoin, the, the ter Terraform last bought, but like for, for few billion, few, few billion amount of Bitcoin. And we don't know like a real int intention, what, you know, jumped it for the UST or like everybody does, doesn't know about that. And like being transparent and being uh, the most resonated by with uh, other like investors and retails is like maybe maybe we can prevent the the next events, but still we cannot prevent all the bubble. I mean the collapse and everything. I think the bubble collapse is very natural mm. in every every industry and even in the stock market and historically up and down, up and down, whenever, you know, there's 10 to 20 waves, the more mature system come out. And that's, that's how we, how we grow, how we like evolve from the last mistakes. Of course we can, but we cannot prevent, but we can, we can be, uh, mm, make a less possibility to make that happen. It's like, I think, transparent and consi consistency. You told me that Hashed wants to be a bridge between the US and the Asian markets. Yep. Right? Yep. You mentioned a few, you know, places before. Talk me through your kind of geographic strategy and why you decided to open offices in Japan, Singapore, Middle East, and India. Mm -mm -mm. So um, we originated from... Korea, but uh, 2019, we built uh, the U.S. office, San, Fran San Francisco, and now we have uh, L.A. And I moved to Singapore last year. Two years ago, we opened up the, the office in India. Now, like, um, Japan is like the closest country to, uh, of Korea. And Japan's market is opening up now as... Uh, Stock market is all time high. Also, Japanese, Japanese companies are very eager to go out globally and they need a partner. And Middle East also like, you know, a lot of crypto companies coming into uh, Middle East, especially UAE. This must there be a uh, token 2049. Mm. There's a lot of, you know, players want to get uh, their capital, but they don't care about making an ecosystem in Middle East. So we wanted to uh, help them out. So every country has uh, pros and cons and every country uh, want to help and support. Um, 
But the beauty of a blockchain, beauty of a cryptocurrency is borderless. There's no, not, there's local, local community and local industry, but we believe like you know, the global like blockchain company, um, more global than more, more competitive. So um, we want to leverage this uh, character, characteristic to pull the local resource out to to global market. And especially I think uh, we can be a complement to each other. So for example, US market, uh, there's a lot of huge, uh, huge capital there. Uh, Mega VC, A16G Paradigm, uh, Pantera, uh, Multicoin, uh, but there's not, not much retail. Of course, Coinbase there, but Coinbase or allow only accredited investor. So retailers are small, but um, Asia is more like retail centric. So Vietnam, Korea, China, uh, India, Turkey, those, those are like a top five in Binance. So um, we can introduce a US founder to retail in Asia. On the other hand, Asia, there's not many VCs the small handful of VCs here, but not mega VC. So we can introduce these founders to US funds to get a credibility and also get a capital and come back to Asia to onboard uh, retail. So yeah, we, we want to leverage both sides, uh, the benefit. You told me Asia brings speculation and liquidity, West brings credibility. Yeah. And as a result, you want to I mean, you have a big focus on Asian founders who can target both Asia and Western markets. Yeah, yeah. I prefer uh, Asian founder who, who can target both market because both market has a different characteristic. And if you look back uh, the, the successful project in history, especially in crypto space, they always target both. Like, for example, Solana. Solana onboarded a lot of Asian investors and, and founders. For example, Vitalik also stayed in uh, Shanghai for a long time after launching Ethereum. And still he st stay around here, even though he's like originally from uh, the Canada. Yeah. And I like uh, Asian founders because they are still, uh, they want to grow. Um, I mean, especially like, you know, in local market here, they're not, uh, they're a li little bit limited to local market so far, but when they come to Web3 market, they first realize, oh, I can be a global founder. Like I felt I used to be a local Web2 founder. Mm -hmm. And after you know, investing to Ethereum and made a hash, I realized, oh, I can, I can, I can become a global founder and global investor. So. I always resonate the Asian founders, like what they're, uh, what they want to achieve, or what is lack of uh, their their ability. Uh, I want to help out their growth, and I want to be a part of like their their resources. Just one second. I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a few examples of these Asian founders who you like a lot and uh, who are doing exactly that, right? Starting local and then going global. Mm -hmm. The first one is the, that I like to talk about is the one, the man who introduced us, mm -hmm. Sota Watanabe from Astar. Yeah. What do you think about Sota and uh, the way he's, he has this very kind of Web2 approach mm. to Web3, basically, which is, hey, let's start with Japan market and kind of the Web2 conglomerates there. You know, for example, the Sony, the, the Sony uh, pu public blockchain, and then we'll expand from that. Mm. So um, I've been, we, we have been uh, looking at 
Japanese market for a long time. But um, not many Japanese founder was um, like a global founder because I, basically uh, there's a language language barrier. And also, uh, last thirty years, uh, the Japanese found founder or funds the more thing stayed in the Japanese market because Japanese market is big enough. But now it's like you no, know, they're exporting a lot of founders and capital. Little bit, last two years, I think the mood changed a lot. And Sota started in 2019. He is a little bit early, early uh, founder, early adopter of the uh, crypto. And I feel like last one one year, I feel like a Sota is the the guy who can make a who can make a innovation in Japanese crypto market. Of, of course, you no know, in global as well, you know, always like, you know, he can utilize uh, like a lot of resources in Japan and bring them to the global market. And that makes us the Asta more flourish. And obviously, you know, if you think about Japan, like, you know, uh, contents like Sony, also Sony, uh, PlayStation, Sony, uh, pictures and music business. Uh, like uh, animation studios, so lo a lot of a lot of resources he he can utilize, and obviously, the, most of them are very global products, and at the end, I think uh, a lot of contents can deploy on uh, Asta, then Asta itself can be a just global network, and Sota is like very ambitious, has a huge ambition. And he's not limited to just Japanese market. The Sony is just begin, beginning step. But, you know, I feel he's, he's you know, moving forward uh, to the right steps. So, yeah, I, I, like, I like Sota and I want to support them. You said you were one of the first, I mean, you were the first, uh, you were the first check for Sandbox and Axie Infinity. And I think Axie pulled something like, 1,600x last cycle. Hmm. What are the newer projects that you think have the potential to do the same, if not better than Axie over the next few years? Hmm. You mentioned running network before. Mm -mm -mm. So there's a lot of, you know, the products, but uh, if maybe a gaming sector, like few, like Apparel from Hong Kong and D-Labs and Gombo in the uh, Korean market. And some DeFi project like uh, Navi Protocol and Sui, market trade in uh, Aptos. Of course, those are our portfolio. Mm. But um, I feel like you no, know, they're targeting a uh, right, right way and right uh, market. And of course, uh, they they already made a like top notch, top notch product. Do you want to go through a few of them? Talk about why you invested in them. Mm -hmm. Why do you like the team so much and what do you think they're doing so right mm -hmm. compared to others? Yeah, especially I think a uh, gaming uh, perspective, um, most of them already uh, have a, a few years experience of uh, building a product. And I think this reason founder is very flexible. That means like, you know, they always adapt the trends, recent trends and follow, uh, learning the, the customers and community and uh, fix their, their strategy to fit into the market. So that's why like uh, all the founders I, I, I just you know list before, they're very lean and very fast learning, learning curve. Uh, Can you give maybe two examples concrete mm -hmm. of the team and the founder and how they're doing the the ad adapting to the to their basically their users. Mm -mm -mm. For example, uh, D Labs, they uh, the founder used to be a, a huge uh, the mobile game company in Korea, Forster uh, Three. The chairman used to be a CEO of uh, Nexon, and he is you no know, the Web Two founder is more like focusing on just products, like oh good product is good product will make a. Uh, will make huge adoption 
and they will make a, a, a lot of revenue, et cetera, et cetera. So a little, little bit focusing on more like product, but Web3 is more like community driven. So I feel like um, now so like 60 to 70%, they're focusing on the, most of the projects are focusing on the community, 30% uh, products. And DLF used to be a little bit 70% product, 30% community, but now it's like more like sharing his vision and product features, what is the benefit, benefit of their, their platform, et cetera, et cetera. It's more like, you know, uh, became like a, the, the kind of person. And Aperon also like, you know, they, uh, um, they have been building uh, the product five years. And now it's like, they turn out to be a, a token project. Uh, recently they listed on uh, Bybe, but uh, he is like uh, putting a lot of effort to make the right economy of the token. So um, how to uh, like onboard like a user. Uh, of course, like a product at the end, uh, the user have to play the, the, the game, but before like how to make a good incentive scheme and how to touch the, the user's mentality and how to make a hype, the kind of like, you know, kind of marketing perspective. Uh, he is a very uh, flexible to, to change their, his mind. So I like this like very lean and like a high learning curve type of person, the founder. Do you want to talk a bit about the Ronin team? Because mm -hmm. you're the second person on this podcast who is actually now third who is extremely bullish on uh, running. Yes. At the uh, Casper, mm. co-founder of Spartan. Mm. And uh, Daryl Wong from Tangent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you like so much about running and the team? Yeah. So running team has like, you know, their team also very well balanced. For example, like Chong, your CEO, uh, Alexander is a, now as a president of the council, Gio is like a head of BD. So Gio is from US, Trang is from Vietnam, Alexander is from Norway. So very well balanced, the, the co-founding team. So Alexander Gio is more like representing his the company more like global. Trang is a super top <laughs> developer. So he is building always the best product in the market. So uh, Ronin team now is like, they already have a good experience to make a successful game with uh, X Infinity. So he has, they has always like right guideline for the games onboarding to Ronin. Also Ronin itself is like, just, um, they made uh, all the toolkits and uh, level one uh, with like live, live game. So that means like, you no, know, the lady heard a lot of like uh, constraints and like a problem from the gamer directly. And they solve, solve all the problems uh, from like their like signature game X Infinity. Mm. So the benefit, from, benefit of that uh, gives a lot of the games down the road, uh, which, is onboarding, which is onboarding to a Ronin. And all the feedback from the, 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 the gaming companies were super, uh, much better than other like games. I mean, other platforms. So I feel like Rooney is uh, providing first right infrastructure and toolkit for game. Second, they, they have a huge, uh, user base already. Uh, their daily active user is about 700,000 people. That's the third largest one out of the uh, one. And third, uh, they know how to market, how to you know, uh, how to do the right marketing. You told me you're also looking deeply at Japanese anime mm. and Korean pop. Yes. Or K-pop. Yeah. To bring crypto to the masses. Can you tell me what you guys are doing exactly with uh, anime and K-pop? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, anime side, uh, one of our portfolio company, Kazagi Labo, actually a Singaporean founder. Kazagi Labo. Yes. He acquired, uh, Naji studio in Japan, the Japanese anime studio, also very close to a top 
anime studios in Japan. So eventually he want to onboard like a Japanese IP to the, the blockchain space. And, you know, now a lot of tries are happening in Japanese anime, like, you know, Ajuki, Ajuki just you know, launched uh, the anime chain. And the thing is uh, quite you no know, reasonable because uh, Japanese anime now is like all time high. The viewership is all time high. And actually f the fan is very, very sticky. Like you know, there's a lot of you know, fanatics around Japanese anime. You know, there's a lot of costume and they're buying a lot of, you know, stickers and goods for the, the anime. That means like they can make uh, their own network. That's why I you know they're like considering to build an anime chain as well. And this, this guy, uh, Kasagi Labo, he, he is cap capable to onboard like the top tier IP from Japan. So that's why they're building this anime chain. And K-pop chain also, you know, K-pop chain is like initiated by uh, our studio. We build our own uh, K-pop entertainment company named uh, uh, Mood House. We have a two idol group, uh, Triple S and uh, Artemis. I'm not sure you're familiar to K-pop idols. Not that much. <laughs> not that much. <laughs> not that much, but I'll say uh, K-pop also very global. Uh, K-pop has a global audience. But how does... How is K-pop linked to blockchain? Yeah, yeah. Like what, what's the benefit, benefit of the blockchain for the K-pop industry? Um, like a lot of fans, when they onboard, they can buy NFTs or like go governance token of the each K-pop group mm. or uh, anime, anime IP. And fans or the fans can participate like not total governance, but uh, they can enjoy to participate. Mm. So, uh, so far, most of the consumer of the contents were just consuming. So watching the contents and buying the contents. But, you know, Web3, the beauty of the Web3 is uh, they can own it. Absolutely. Chris Dixon's new book is a rewrite. Own. own, right? Yep. So they can, they can be a uh, owner of the certain IP, then they can participate more resource and effort to the IP. So this would not only be for like very established groups yet, but also to fund people or groups or bands in which you believe, right? Is this the goal or now it's more targeted at the big ones currently? Um, Because the dream is really, hey, yeah, yeah. my best friend, or I, I go to a bar, mm -hmm. I see this amazing singer, mm -hmm. let's say K-pop or K-pop band, mm -hmm. but they're not known. Mm -hmm. I can invest in them. And then if they become mega famous, like Coldplay or whatever, huge, right. or huge yeah. K-pop band, I can participate in the upside, not only by going to my friends and say, hey, listen to this song, but actually have a financial incentive. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is also one of the scenario, very prominent scenario, mm. like funding to the new IP and I can make a return from like selling in the future. But more like, you know, the, those activity itself is a very important, like, you know, the goods and the governance and everything. The, how the fans, I mean, the, the K-pop star can, uh, um, engage with the fans mm. and how like it's a, like a crypto project founder if you like just making product rather than just making product always in the community in the twitter in the conference they engage with the the investor or even though they're not investor potential investor and onboard them to uh, our narrative our thesis and making a bigger community that's how the crypto project can become a successful, right? So I think K-pop or Japanese anime can do quite similar way. Yeah. What are some non-contentious ways to bring crypto to the masses that you think will, in hindsight, look obvious in a few years? Non-crypto. So Non-consensus. So something you really believe that in yet now, mm or you think might be, you know, might have a high likelihood that it's going to make a big impact on crypto mass adoption? 
But people don't really think it's stupid, maybe, right? Mm. But in a few years, they will realize, oh man, that made so much sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So question is like, what what type of yeah. product? Um, basically, I think um, like I think uh, the. Already mass adopted uh, the services like uh, now Telegram or like Twitter. Those are like trying to onboard like the wallet, right? Mm. Integrating wallet and user spontaneously, you know, making a wallet address and maybe connect them to uh, other like web free applications. I think Telegram is quite interesting case because um, s many people uh, personally, I f I feel a little bit worried about security of the telegram because I saw many people got hacked, mm. many, many telegram ID got hacked, but I think the security level should be quite similar, same level as uh, Binance or OKX, like centralized and maybe uh, we can secure with the two factor and like more, we can put more uh, secure uh, like tool. And then like uh, people will be uh, very easily, you know, th they will easily understand like how to transfer money to my friends, mm -hmm. how is easy they can use uh, the application and also how they can, they can make a, a creative product on top of the messenger protocol. I think that is uh, one of the big, uh, big chance to make a mass adoption. Like social, I mean, maybe we can see how the Twitter uh, turned out to be a super app, mm. but a lot of social, using social services, they will try to onboard uh, crypto prison. Absolutely. The, te the Telegram one is such a no-brainer. Yeah. I think it's what, 7 million active users or something seven, like that? Uh, 700, 700 million, sorry. 700 million, yeah. 700 million active users. Telegram is the most used app in crypto with Twitter, obviously, like, so it's kind of a no brainer. Yeah. One of your new mantra in life is sustainability. Yeah. It's obviously easier said than done, right? Mm -hmm. So what does sustainability mean to you? And how do you reach a sustainable life across personal, family and business life? Yeah, yeah, for sure. This is, um, recently I, I last, Two years, I, I, I thought a lot about uh, sustainability. So um, everyone is saying like, you know, how they can make a sustainable ecosystem, sustainable community. And I realized like, you know, in deep in my heart, after having my, my kids, like, I feel like, you no, know, oh, my kids, no, my, my life, I feel like I, my life extended, uh, maybe 30 to 40 years more. When you had kids? When I had kids. Yeah. Why? Because no, I have to take care of, uh, the, the world and ecosystem after I die until my kid die. <laughs> because, um, before I have, I have my kids. I always take care of my, my life, mm -hmm. my like prosperity or my success. Mm -hmm. But after having family, after having a kid, you know, I little bit share my, my, uh, joy and my prosperity and my, uh, all the, no, no, in, in, like I said, excitement with my kid. And I feel like my kid is like, uh, make me, uh, more, make me, uh, more long, longer life. So after my, no, after my, my death, no, if my kids will leave 30, 40 years more then the ecosystem or my, for example, nature or like, uh, the earth have to be, uh, fine. On for uh, 30, 40 years mm. more, right? And if my kids have kids, then that, uh, their life extends 30 years more. 
and <laughs> kids warm you more more come out than 30 years more so it's how i last uh, the my my uh my prosperity for longer term so you feel like less self-centered you feel it's kind of like the the definition of spirituality is thinking outside of yourself right mm -hmm. thinking thinking about other people around you which is probably one of the key to happiness <laughs> Yeah. Because if you just think about yourselves, probably not going to be the most fulfilling life. But it's very interesting what you're saying. Like, oh, now that I have a kid, I feel like I'm extending my life because I need to make sure that the environment that they grow and evolve in is a great place, right? Mm -hmm. And that you didn't feel like that before. Yeah, 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 yeah. How do you think it impacted your day to day concretely? Because you seem to be more thinking, I need to think about the world, right? Mm -hmm. Is it a sustainable place to live, etc.? But you also made some changes to your actual life mm -hmm. to have more balance. Yeah. Um, before uh, before kids came out, uh, I was more risk risk taker. Mm. Still, I'm risk taker in the investment side, but in the personal life and everywhere, I was more. No, aggressive and risk taker, but now it's more like you know, little bit, little bit. I I I feel conservative, and I care. I'm taking care of my body or my mentality more. Yeah, um, my life changed a lot after kid came out, and now I I want more like peaceful life in real life, but dynamic life in on chain. Mm. One chain didn't like you know af affect my body or like you know, but mentality always I'm taking care of. Uh, what, what do you do to take care of yourself? You told me about meditation. Yeah, meditation is always a good tool to make myself a uh, little bit objective. I always know everyone is a very subjective to everything. Then the good thing happened, then uh, my, I, I become very happy. Bad thing happened, I become very negative. But if I become very objective, whenever, what, what, whatever happened, like a good or bad, I can feel more stable. So Be because like, um, I can learn from every event. For example, terror events is very bad. The subjective sp uh, speaking, I should be very, very mad, <laughs> angry. I feel like mm, maybe uh, I can I can turn out to be a, maybe I can grow from this event. Did you have your kids already when Terra happened? Yes. So how did having kids, you told me also about like having a great, great relationships at work, mm -hmm. in your life, mm -hmm. like how much this can give you a sense of perspective and actually even go through terrible things like what happened with Luna? Mm -hmm. So, uh, can you, can you say again the question? The question is how, how does, you know, having this view on perspectives because you have kids, because you have colleagues and you think more about like happiness, more the simple things in life, right? Mm -hmm. Can help you stay grounded even, let's say when everything goes crazy and you feel like a king or when everything goes to shit mm -hmm. and you feel bad. And at the end of the day, you realize people are doing well, people are happy here. There's good relationships being built. Mm. Uh, everybody's healthy. Yeah, yeah. So at the end of the day, it's not that bad, even if there is terrible things happening. Right, right. So I think the making a balance between uh, three three components around my life is very important. One is myself. Second one is my family, and third one is my uh, my business, my company. So every month I'm, I'm like remind what happened for me, for my family and for my, my business and checking is good or not. If it makes me, uh, always like very stable because even though business <clears throat> in business, a uh, bad thing happened. If myself and my, com my family is really stable and happy then, okay, I can figure out the business side later. But if business is all my life, 
that is like too risky. The business once once business go bad, then my life is all all my life is bad. So I I call this like portfolio of happiness. So making good portfolio for happiness, then your happiness can be a very stable, stably always happy. But you put all the happiness to the one bucket, like. Bitcoin. <laughs> so then once Bitcoin go up, happy. Once go, Bitcoin go down, unhappy. <laughs> then like, you no, know, two, one to two years uh, out of four years, like every happening period, you you will be not happy. So, um, yeah, I, I call this like a portfolio of the uh, happiness and life and everything. So that the huge part is like myself, family and business. So yourself, family, and Bitcoin. <laughs> That's the portfolio of happiness. Yeah. That's an amazing way to finish this uh, conversation. What's your biggest prediction for next 12 months? Um, I think still we will be in the, in the middle of bull market, I believe. Um, of course, the bear market um, will come at a, a certain point. But... I think still the overall, you know, if you if you see the Google trend, if you type the Bitcoin, the the search uh, index of Bitcoin is still half of last bull cycle, so still growing, and adoption will happen more, and but um, of course, like I want to see the real use case and real mass adoption rather than just speculative uh, trading. Pumping and dumping. Meme coin is a one uh, quite interesting phenomenon. But still, I think um, I want to push uh, more pro projects, like, which is a very useful, uh, useful and helpful for the for the ecosystem. Let's end this conversation with your view on meme coins, mm. because I talk about meme coin with everyone here. Yeah, yeah. Meme coin is like uh, the final form of spe speculation, I think. But it's very fun. So I'll say like, you know, uh, for example, casino. Casino business. Yes, I, I, um, I think casino is not good for uh, ecosystem, but still alive and still we cannot, we cannot stop them. Mm. Everybody will bet mm. on something, right? So... We can, we should you should handle uh, the mean coin. Mean coin is very spontaneously that everybody trade, and I I hope this energy of mean coin can transform to the like you no know, to support the better the good project. I mean, making a liquidity liquidity of the good projects. Amazing! Thank you so much for doing this. It was a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me.